So if you've been following along each week, uh, each night, we've been taking up some different words that are found in what we have called the gospel message, the message that is good news, of how you can know your sins forgiven. And we've looked at a, a whole uh, array of words, um, and, and they've been varied and different. And each night we've showed how words that are opposites, words that, that, that are not synonymous in the least bit, have been brought together in this wonderful message of the gospel. And so tonight, here on what is our sixth meeting, tonight the words that we're going to address are words that are, are still used within normal context on a day-to-day -day basis and are especially used in our Bible, and they are the words sorrow and the word joy. And so we're going to speak on those words tonight. It's my obligation to take up the word sorrow. And I want to read one verse with you. It's found in your Old Testament in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53. And we're going to read one verse here. Isaiah 53 is a great chapter. It's a chapter that, that if you were to read it, you would have no, you would have no doubt in your mind that, that the prophet was speaking of Jesus Christ. And yet it was a chapter that was written hundreds and hundreds of years before he ever came. So we're going to read a very famous verse. Uh, all the verses are famous in Isaiah 53, but we're going to read one verse here, verse number three in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 and verse three says this. If you have a Bible at home, you can follow along or just listen to these words. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. I just want to read that verse one more time. I want to think about this title given to Jesus Christ years before he came. And this is the title. We read it here. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows. A man of sorrows. It's one of the great titles of Jesus Christ. If you tuned in early tonight and you listened to some of the music that plays as we get the meeting going, or really it's an interlude to the meeting. That first hymn that you heard, and it was an instrumental, none of the words were played tonight. Uh, that first hymn that you heard is the great hymn written by a man named Philip Paul Bliss. And he was born years ago in the uh, 1800s. He died in 1876 tragically at a very young age in a train crash. But one of the last hymns that he penned in 1875 was this hymn, Man of Sorrows. I, I, I love that hymn. It's one of the great hymns of Christianity, one of the great hymns of, that have been penned in the past century. And when you look up Philip Bliss and all the times in which he sung and all the things that a lot of men say the last hymn that they heard him sing was this one right here. He sang it at a prison, actually in a place I visited, Jackson, Michigan. He sang it in a prison there and he sang it after he delivered a message on the man of sorrows, he sang his hymn. If you've never heard the hymn, it has thrilling words, but it's a, it's a great evidence of how sorrow and joy come together. Because if you listen to the words that Mr. Bliss penned, he said this in his hymn. This is how the first stanza goes. Man of sorrows, what a name for the son of God who came. Ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah. What a savior. How do you go from sorrow to hallelujah? My friend, it is impossible outside of Jesus Christ. Impossible. And this hymn tells it all that Mr. Bliss wrote so long ago that the only way in which we get from a man of sorrows to us exclaiming that this man of sorrows is a savior. The hallelujah leaves the human lips for the man of sorrows. Why? because his sorrow was to take our place at Calvary and die for us. I want to speak on this title, and I want to speak on the sorrow of Christ tonight, and hopefully be able to tell you something of the good news of the gospel, and how you can know that this man's sorrow is your salvation, that what this man went through, he went through in order to save your soul. You need nothing more than Christ and him crucified, and that is enough to save you, to give you meaning in life, to give you purpose is found in this man of sorrows.
this hymn and these verses, they, they line up. You listen to the hymn later on, and you'll see how Mr. Bliss, he took all these uh, thoughts that come from Isaiah 53. But we read here about a man of sorrows. He was despised and rejected. He was acquainted with grief. His only acquaintance, we could say on earth, was grief. And such a sorrowful title, sorrowful title to, to give to this man, Jesus Christ. You know, it was given to him hundreds of years, like I said, before he ever came. But, you know, when you look through your Bible, you want to know what is amazing? A lot of people would, would agree the greatest sorrow in life is to lose a loved one. I don't know of a greater sorrow that the human soul can go through than to lose someone you love, especially if it's before you expected them to go, even when they are older. It is still a tragic and a great sorrow to lose someone you love. And yet when we see Jesus Christ who gave his life, you know that when you read through your New Testament, there is not a single writer in your New Testament who reflects on the death of Christ with sorrow. Just the opposite. Just the opposite. It's the Apostle Paul who says, forbid it, Lord, that I boast or glory in anything else except for the cross of Jesus Christ. So if the name was given to him, a man of sorrows, and it was so true of his life that every day on this earth was one filled with sorrow and grief, we reflect on his death, we reflect on his life, and we think anything but sorrow. We think of joy. And you might ask me, how is that possible? How can that be so? I want to speak on that tonight because in our own lives, it seems that we can't be bothered for the most part. We would have to agree as citizens and as neighbors and as family members, it is difficult to be bothered with other people's sorrows. We almost would say we have enough of our own. There's enough sorrow to fill today. We can't be bothered with other people's sorrows. But this man, Jesus Christ, he his sole purpose of coming into this world was to be a man of sorrows to the point that he was willing to suffer for the sorrows caused by sin in this world. He was willing to suffer for you and for me. And I want to take a look at him tonight, this man, Jesus Christ, because in the last 24 hours of his life, we believe he lived a life of almost 33, 34 years in this world. But it wasn't until the last day of his life that he mentioned, as we have recorded in our Bible, wasn't until his last 24 hours that he mentioned his sorrow and he mentioned your sorrow. It was in that last 24-hour period that he mentioned his own, and he mentioned yours. And in both cases, we have this tremendous truth of sorrow being turned into joy. Matt's going to speak on joy, but I want to focus on these two thoughts tonight of sorrow from the man of sorrows, Jesus Christ. We read of the first instance there. And we read it in the Gospel of John, chapter 16. And the Lord Jesus is, is speaking to his disciples. And he says, when they take my life, or he says, when I leave, I'm going to leave here. When I go, you shall weep and you shall lament. But the world, the world will rejoice. The world will re rejoice to get rid of me. He says, but this is what he says. He says, and you shall be sorrowful. But your sorrow will be turned into joy. He doesn't say your sorrow will be exchanged for joy. Sometimes we think that's easy enough. You're sad one day, you push it aside, you bring in some joy. But here, and only here, the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, your sorrow will be turned into joy. How is that possible? How is that? A lot of times when we lose someone, when we visit the graveside years later, when we see pictures of them, there's no displacement of the sorrow of loss. So why is it with Jesus Christ when I look at him nailed on a cross, when I look at him there and I think of what put him there, I think of the shame. I think of my sins that put him there. I think of a world and we must admit that those are the darkest six hours of this world's history where those hours from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. on a Friday afternoon in April when we crucified our creator, those are the world's darkest six hours of everything that this world has done that is despicable. Never did we sink to such a depth as when we hung the one who hung the world on nothing, when we hung him on a cross. And for six hours, he suffered for our sins. Never have we stooped to such a low level. 
And yet those were heaven's finest six hours. Heaven's finest hours were when God's only son hung on a cross. How can it be? How can the two come together? Such sorrow that Christ died for sins. He died for the worst that humanity could offer. And he didn't choose which people to die for. The, the Some that were this way or some. He died for sinners. It's just a term that includes all of humanity, as we were being told last night. And such a sorrow. When I reflect on, on those six hours, I think in my own shame of what I've done that put him there. You say, I should, I should crumble under the weight of that sorrow. But I never, never, ever think of the cross without tremendous joy coming to my heart. Why? Because I realized that Christ died. He suffered. That the sorrow that he endured was for me. It was for me. It's the same way if, if anybody has ever lost someone in their family uh, uh, to, the, to, to, to war, if anybody has a, a veteran in their family or someone who's fought overseas and lost their life, we reflect on the loss of, of service men and women overseas with sorrow. But yet we think of what they did when they gave their lives for our freedom. And here is the ultimate exchange, the ultimate substitute. When the man of sorrows suffered for this sinner, I say I can't reflect on it with sorrow. I reflect on it with joy because it was my sins that put him there. But it was that man, Jesus Christ, the man of sorrows that suffered for me. And so when he says, and he could say it again, your sorrow will be turned into joy. You might ask, how in the world can that happen? Well, because my sins are, my sins are, are awful. All that I've done, never would I want anybody to know of them. But you see, it's my sins that qualify me for this salvation. My sins put me in a category that is despicable, the ungodly, sinners, those who are wretched. But they put me in a category for whom Christ died. And so my sorrow is turned into joy. I think of the other time in which the Lord Jesus used these words. And we read of them in the Gospel of Matthew 26. We read about him in a garden of Gethsemane. It's, it's, it's hours before he's going to be tried. And it's, it's just minutes before they come, where Judas comes into that garden to take him away. And we hear him saying these words. He says, now is my soul exceedingly sorrowful. He says those words even unto death. He had such sorrow in himself that it could have crushed a man had it been a normal man. But in the Son of God, he says, even unto death. And then he has these tremendous words. He says to his father above, he says, he refers to all the sins that he was going to bear as a cup. He says, if there's any other way for this cup to be taken care of, please take it away. But if this is the way salvation will be made, he says, not what I want, but what you want. Not my will, but yours be done. It's a beautiful, a beautiful display of what the Son of God voluntarily did when he says, not what I want, but what the father wants. He talked about his own sorrow. He thought of the sin. You know, we, we often remark about sin. It doesn't even affect us so much anymore. Some, some people would even come to say, I didn't even know that was wrong. I didn't know it was wrong to do that. I didn't know it was wrong to say that. We, we've become so callous to it. We often say, don't ask a fish what water feels like. Don't ask a human being what sin feels like. But to ask the Son of God, he was one who was perfect, sinless. He never thought a sin, never did a sin. He never, he never had anything leave his mouth that was sinful. You say he was perfect. He was holy. If anyone was ever going to know what sin felt like, it was him. And there, he felt its weight. He could feel what it was going to do. It was going to crush him at Calvary. And yet his words were this, not my will, but yours be done. Because he got so much delight in doing what his father wanted. And that's the message of the gospel of a man here, Jesus Christ. And his, his sole desire was to please his father. The joy, the Bible tells him, that was set before him. What was that joy? That joy was seeing you reconciled to the father, seeing you saved. That was the joy set before him. He endured this sorrow. And so just there in his last day, his last 24 hours, he spoke about your sorrow. Maybe you have sorrows no one knows about. 
Maybe you think you'll die with those sorrows. There's nothing that could take them from your soul. A lot of people have sadness that they can never get rid of. And and I don't I don't necessarily have answers for all that tonight. But I can tell you this, if you've ever had any anguish or sorrow over the sins that you have in your life, if you have any sorrow about the wrongs that you've committed, about the way we are, that sorrow can be turned into joy if you recognize that Christ died for sinners, that Christ took your place at Calvary. That sorrow, my friend, can be done away with. It can be turned to joy in an instant when you realize all the wrongs that we've done were placed on Jesus Christ when he died for us. And if you have any notion, you think, did he really want to do it? Is this someone I can trust? We see that second time he used it. And he could say he had a soul that was sorrowful beyond any other man's sorrow. And yet he was willing to bear that. He was willing to die in my place. Why? Because of the joy that he found in taking the place of sinners and doing what the father wanted. And so tonight in this gospel message, I would ask you of a joy that you could have in knowing your sins forgiven, of a joy that heaven has in seeing sinners brought to Christ the Savior. And as you continue to listen to Matt speak, realize this tonight. Sorrow is something that every human being experiences in this world. There is not, there is not an individual on this globe that has not in one way or another experienced sorrow. That is true. That's undeniable. But recognize this, Jesus Christ, was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. It was, it was said about his life before he ever came. He was a man of sorrows. And you might ask the question, what, what a title for a man to come. But reflect on this, that the one who was a man of sorrows, he's the man of Calvary. That sorrow was never greater than at Calvary, but neither was joy. And you can know the joy of sins forgiven by placing your trust in him. Continue to listen to Matt as he tells us about the joy that we can know in our sins being forgiven, a joy that Christ can give through the finished work of Calvary. Thanks, Dave. We're going to read just two verses uh, tonight. First one is in 1 Peter chapter 1. Thanks for being on the call with us this evening. Uh, 1 Peter in chapter 1 in verse 7 through 9. But I'm going to sort of break in here. Uh, and it says these words, at the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. If you're listening on the call, this might sound uh, perhaps confusing. It's okay. I'm going to get to a word that's on my heart tonight. Whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye not see or ye see him not, yet believing ye receive or ye, we, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable. Okay. Pay attention to those words. Ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, or the assurance of salvation through faith. And the other reading is just in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2. David uh, mentioned this verse in scripture uh, in his preaching tonight. Verse 2 reads this as he's speaking about the power of hope in Christ and really running a race. Verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy, that word joy is what we're going to speak about tonight, that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And that's all we're going to read this evening. Uh, why is it, or how is it, that believers, if you know a believer, for someone who's come to trust Christ, someone who tells you that they're saved, or they've been born again, or they have a relationship with Christ, how can they rejoice with joy that's inexpressible. Very strong language there. I would tell you this, that there's a day that, as David spoke about, sinners that were under sorrow, there's a day that we were filled with sorrow that aligns itself with sin's curse. And now when a, a sinner has been saved by the grace of God, they have now been born again, and they have this joy or this peace with God that is inexpressible. That meaning of inexpressible is a feeling that's too strong or too strong to be described or conveyed with words. And so here the writer is saying that we have a joy that is inexpressible. And it speaks about Christ in Hebrews chapter 12, who for the joy that was set before Christ endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne 
of God. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Those words, who for the joy that was before him endured the cross, one might ask the question, well, what was this joy? Was it a joy like we enjoy life today with laughter and sort of partying and, and a lot of singing, perhaps? It's not the joy that we're talking about here. Perhaps satisfaction, the joy of fulfilling the will of the Father. You think of the words found in Psalm and chapter 40 and also in the book of Hebrews, the, those words that say, behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. And when Christ was on this earth, he was in subjection to his Father. His full delight, his full joy was to do the Father's will, to go to a place called Calvary, to hang on a rugged cross, to give his life for sinners, to redeem men back to him. He tasted death for every man. He endured a cross. He despised the shame of a graceful death on the cross. He ever appears in the presence of God for believers and continues his exhibition of himself as our sacrifice and his intercession as our mediator. God's word says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. It never can in any sense be said of Jesus that he endured the cross in a prospect of gaining an everlasting glory when he had the fullness of that glory with the Father before the world began. You ask me, well, where do you see that? Well, John chapter 17 and verse 5 says these words, and now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it was from the full knowledge of the joy that would flow out of his victory on the cross that Christ endured the cross. He despised the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That joy that set before him was the joy of reversing, if we can use those words and just sort of let your mind flow with this for a moment. The joy of reversing at last for once in time and all of eternity, the tragic defeat of humanity in the paradise garden of Eden. God had created man, Adam and Eve, and there they are in the garden, and they were to touch everything except one thing. And then the Bible teaches that as they sinned, as they broke the commandment from God, they're found naked. And God comes into the garden and God says, Adam, where are you today? The Bible teaches this when we look at the fall of man in the garden. Wherefore is by one man sin entered and death by sin so that death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Christ was filled with joy because he would provide salvation to fallen man. That fallen man thousands of years ago is the same fallen man Today on the call, if you've never come to understand who Christ is and why he came, I would tell you today, dear friend, with eyes of faith, look to a cross because God provided a sacrifice on that cross that would take away your sins in the past, your sins today, and your sins forever. Jesus says, I, their sins and their iniquities, I will remember no more. The joy of knowing that Satan's purpose of destroying man had been foiled. The joy of bringing many sons into glory. That's what Hebrews chapter two and verse tells. To, to, tell, uh, chapter two and verse ten tells us. The joy of taking the drunkard. The joy of taking the liar. The joy of taking the thief. Taking the immoral. Taking the impure. Taking the unholy. Taking the unrighteous. Taking the wicked. Taking the self-righteous. Taking the sinner. The joy of taking that person and bringing them into making them into a son of glory all through a cross. It's what motivated Christ. It's what drove Christ. And he went to a cross for the joy that was set before him. First Corinthians chapter one says these words. And if, and if I, if I have a night, one of these nights, I'll take up this verse in verse 18 for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us, which are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. There are individuals on this call. You're saved. You're on your way to heaven. Not because of any work that you've done to, Earn yourself to heaven. You're saved simply through faith in Christ. And you've accepted the grace that God provides in the gift of his eternal son. Christ had the joy of the saved entering heaven as he realizes that if there was a sacrifice for sins once and forever, a sinless sacrifice, the Godhead dying for the creation, the creator dying for the creation, is the joy of the saved entering heaven. Dave mentioned those words tonight, joy of the presence of angels over one soul repenting with songs of everlasting joys on the, upon their heads, Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 10 says. The joy of the herald angels, tidings of great joy to all people. That's another word we find joy in scripture. No greater message has ever hit earth than the message that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. For the joy that was before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He died, he was buried, and he rose again to set you free, to give you eternal life 
such marvelous joy that in truth, the writer is saying, no vocabulary across the world. If you took every poet and every scribe, no vocabulary could describe this joy. No rhetoric could suggest it or finite mind could fully conceive it. It's placed in the balances of consideration and weighed against the epic sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ, who passed through that unspeakable joy overwhelmingly prevailed. It's precisely this type of weighing one thing against another that Paul's writing here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He's saying, for our light affliction, which is in the moment, believers, work is for us and more exceedingly an eternal weight of glory. For this joy. Rick Warren said these words speaking about joy. He said, joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life. The quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right. And the determined choice to praise God in every situation. I would tell you today, very confidently from the word of God, that joy could never be experienced unless you are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And that comes from being born from above. There was a day when we were born in our sins. It's your birthday, my birthday as well. But there's a day that a, someone, an, an individual, a sinner has to be born from above. It's a day when they place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for all of eternity. Pepheos describes it as this. Joy isn't like happiness that uh, we experience perhaps on this earth, but it's based upon happenings or whether things are going well or not. No, joy remains amidst the suffering. Joy is not as happiness, if you're to put the two together. Joy is an emotion that's acquired by anticipation, acquisition, or even the expectation of something great or wonderful. It can be described as exhilaration. It can be described as delight or sheer gladness. It results from a great success or a very beautiful or wonderful experience, like a wedding or a graduation. But the definition of joy that the world holds is not nearly as amazing as the biblical joy, because joy, this biblical joy, is a gift. It's a gift of God. It's eternal life. There's no greater joy I've ever experienced in experiencing for the first time in my life that Christ Jesus had paid for every sin that I had ever committed. No reason to regret sins in the past. He paid for sins. In the Bible, we read of joy in many occasions. We read of the fruit of the Spirit. Paul speaks of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, fruits of the indwelling Spirit. That's someone that has come to trust Christ. That's someone that is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, which happens the day that you're converted, the day that you've been born from above. Someone on this call today, can I just ask, have you ever met someone that is filled with joy? You walk away from the conversation saying, boy, there was so much peace there. There was so much joy there. It's almost as if nothing could ever frazzle the person. Do you have peace today? Do you have joy? When you know that your life will be past it, you just look at life and all its headaches and its trials. You just say, I'm going to heaven. Christ died for my sins. I have true joy. There's nothing that could ever break that. Joy of the disciples we see in scripture. Paul receives joy from Philemon, that word joy. I receive much joy, he says, and comfort from your love. That brotherly, united place that a believer has with other believers across the world, united through the blood of Christ, it brings joy. Personally, I would tell you, there's no joy, and I've experienced some pretty amazing things in life, and some headaches and heartaches, but there's no joy from the day on August 19th, 2001, when I came to know that Christ Jesus paid for my sins. There's no joy like it. Very interesting. Zach Efron, who's a, a very famous uh, Hollywood star, he's worth $24 million. While doing a documentary, you can look at it perhaps on Netflix, uh, called Down to Earth. It actually caught my attention. I watched it just for a moment. It was really on what Earth provides humanity and how we're really not very grateful for it. But it's very interesting. Um, but he's meeting people in this that realize the purpose in their life, and they gave their life to this cause. And what he's saying on the camera as he reflects, it really struck me just earlier today. I was just observing this for a moment. He said this, what led me to study Earth is I realized, now think about this, a Hollywood star, very good looking. He's got all the toys. He's got all the money. He's worth $24 million. He said, I realized this. What is life? There is something greater out there, he said. I'm just saying the words that he said. My Hollywood life doesn't bring me joy. Daily, he says, I'm running a treadmill wheel, trying to keep up, yet I'm burned out with no peace and joy. What's life? What about on the call today? Perhaps there are those on the call, you've experienced the world's successes, big cars. Big, there's nothing wrong with these things. There's nothing wrong with being rich unless it gets you in the way of trusting Christ. But maybe you've experienced the successes, the big cars, big estates, the dreams. It's never enough. We're never satisfied. We can never truly be filled with inexpressible joy. It's interesting if you look at joy that there's some moments on earth that do bring joy, but never inexpressible. Do you want to know why? You say, well, Matt, I'll listen. Hold on. Uh, 
stop right there because I don't agree. There's some things that I've experienced that are in now. Inexpressible joy, inexpressible joy. Listen carefully. It's a joy that never is disappointed with what it has found true joy in. I'll repeat that. Inexpressible joy is a joy that is never that never is disappointed with what it has found true joy in. And there's nothing on this earth that will give man true joy without some disappointments. You say, well, I've been married. And yes, marriage is wonderful. One of the happiest days of my life. Joy inexpressible, perhaps, until, until one of us makes a mistake, right? Perhaps it's a birthday celebration, and you're younger on the call. Joy inexpressible. You said, oh, Matt, my birthday was the best day of my life until the next day hits. And you realize you're one year closer. I'm going to be serious for a second, but to dying, especially as you age. I'll be 41, and it seems every year I don't even, I'm not too concerned with my birthday anymore. I'm getting closer to 50 and then 60. And for those younger, you wait another year for presents. This is not joy that's inexpressible. Joy of the first day in kindergarten until you realize that you need to spend another 12 years and graduate high school. And then there's the joy of the high school graduation. And then you realize there's college. And then you realize there's a career. And then you realize there's paying for college. And then the marriage. And then a home to provide for the family and reliable vehicles. We're never satisfied. There's joy on this earth that is not inexpressible. God provides joy that is inexpressible. Perhaps you say, well, I've had a promotion at work. Inexpressible. No, not really. Uh, until you realize you have longer hours, you're stressed, you're replaced perhaps by someone who's younger and cheaper. Nothing on this earth satisfies. Nothing has permanent joy except for salvation through Christ. Dion Sanders, a man who perhaps I've mentioned his testimony before. Very interesting. I was reading just up on him just uh, earlier today. A net worth of $40 million. They called him primetime. They called him Neon Dion. NFL for 14 seasons. Atlanta Fal Falcons, 49ers, Dallas Cowboys, Redskins, Baltimore Ravens. Also, he had part-time uh, major leagues in the New York Yankees, Atlanta Braves, Cincinnati Reds, San Francisco Giants. But if you study his story on how he came to know Christ, a man who won two Super Bowl titles and made the World Series appearance in 1992, making him the only person to ever appear in both a World Series and a Super Bowl. In 2010 on November, inducted into the Atlanta Falcons Ring of Honor. You'd say, oh, this man has everything. That's inexpressible joy. You know, there was an autobiography written about him in 1998 that he helped publish. It was called this, Power, Money, and Sex, How Success Almost Ruined My Life. In his story, when you Google his testimony, he says, I'm sitting there one day looking at one of my third Lamborghinis in my garage, and I felt empty. He said, I was empty, no peace, no joy, losing hope with the progression of everything. More money, more fame, but he's losing hope. He said, I would stand near highways wondering, if someone would veer off and take me off earth, I had no joy. One day he took one of his Mercedes. He drove it off a 40-foot cliff to end it all, but he lived. He said, I finally just got on my knees and gave it all to the Lord. I went from the enemy's team, he says, being one of his soldiers to God's team. Do you think Dion has found joy inexpressible? Absolutely. Do you think he has any regrets? Never. Do you think he has any disappointments with coming to trust Christ? Never. Very interesting. In 2016, on his Instagram, he wrote these words. God was there when many of y'all talked about me, when many doubted me, when many lied on me, when many cheated me, when many turned your back on me, bet against me, hated on me, stole from me, tried to kill me physically, verbally. He continues these words. That's why, he says, I praise him like there's no tomorrow. The joy of having God in your life is inexpressible because God never disappoints. I'm going to close with a hymn because time is ticking and I want to end with 15 minutes. What is the song of the believer when he comes to trust Christ, rejoicing in that joy that's inexpressible? Charles Hutchins Gabriel in 1856 and 1932 wrote these words, and I just echo these words because it's something that we can truly enjoy as believers as we think of the joy that's inexpressible. He said these words, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean. For me, it was in the garden. He prayed, not my will, but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. In pity, angels beheld him and came from the world of light to strengthen him in the sorrows he bore for my soul that night. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. When with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see. T'will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. Joy inexpressible. How marvelous, how wonderful, he continues, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Experience this inexpressible joy this evening.
Come to faith in Christ. Rest in his work of salvation accomplished on an old rugged cross just for you. Let's pray together.